Hello and welcome to IB Physics Made Easy. Today we are going to work on some exam exercises. And these exercises will all be related to circular motion. So if you have an exam, an IB exam coming up, perfect video for you. If you have a question about circular motion in an exam, there's high chances there will be some mechanics in it. So the exercises in this video will also involve some mechanics. Are you ready? When the text of the exercise appears on the screen, please press pause, work it out by yourself, give it a shot, and then resume the video to watch the solution. Welcome back. How did it go? Let's look now at the solution. A ball of mass M is placed at rest on a slope at a height of 5R. It gains speed by going down the slope and enters a circular motion by arriving onto a circular track. The radius of this loop is R. The question is to demonstrate that the normal force of the track on the ball at point A is equal to 5mg. That is what we're looking for. So, I want to find the normal force. Therefore, I want to find the force. So, I'm going to apply laws of Newton. Usually, it's the way to go. And before that, I'm going to look at what are the forces I have on point A. Well, I have gravity, so mg, and I have the normal force. So now I can apply the laws of Newton. Sum of the forces equals ma. That is, n plus mg equals ma. Now, I want to get rid of the arrows. Therefore, I define first a positive direction and I notice that all my forces are downwards, so here are positive. I also know that the acceleration will be towards the center of the circle, therefore here also downwards positive. So I can write n plus mg equals ma. Now, I know that the acceleration is that of a circular motion. Therefore, I can replace A by B squared on R. And express M, therefore, as MV squared on R minus MG. <coughs> so I'm getting somewhere. I know M, G, obviously, R. But I don't know V. So how, how am I going to find V? Let's look at the problem in more generally. I see a ball here that is at a height of 5r and that will end up at a height of twice the radius, so 2r. Therefore, I will have a change in height, consequently a change in potential energy. Where does this potential energy go? It goes into kinetic energy. And indeed, I started at rest and now I have a certain velocity v at point a. So, energy is conserved. I'm going to write it down. mg delta h, what I call h, will be the difference in height, is equal to the kinetic energy gained. Now I can remove the m's, and you see I have an expression of v squared now. So, and I find v squared equals 2g delta h. Delta H is a change of height, so 5R minus twice the radius minus 2R. So 2G, 5R minus 2R, giving me 5 minus 2, 3, 6GR. Now, if I use this equation and I inject 6GR for V squared, 
I find n equals n 6g r on r minus ng. So if I remove the r's, I get n equals 6 mg minus ng equals 5 mg. Here I am. I found the solution. <coughs> I encourage you to try to do the same thing at point B and at point C. At point B, uh, what should I write? You will find 8 mg. And at point C, 11 mg. Note that each time it's a different problem. For instance, in C, you might want to choose a positive axis. Are you ready for the second exercise? Here we go. Let's look at the solution. A mass m is attached to a string and is swirled in a vertical circle of radius r with a constant speed v. And there are two points in this circle, a and b. And it, so if I place my mass at point a, I can see a velocity v. It's a constant one, so it will be the same here. Draw the forces on the mass at points A and B. Well, at point A, there's the force due to gravity. And there will also be the tension of the string. At point B, also, you will have gravity. And for the tension, you can imagine that the tension of the string will be higher on the low part, because it's pulled by gravity. Find an expression for the tension in the string at point A and B. So let's look at A. Well, I can just apply the, uh, the laws of Newton. To find a force, therefore, second law of Newton is usually the way to go. So, the law of Newton says that the sum of the forces equals ma. The for sum of the forces is tension plus mg equals ma. Now, I want to get rid of the arrows to define the sign of my forces, so I will define a positive axis. I put it downwards because all the forces are downwards, so it's more practical. So I get T plus mg, they're both positive within this uh, axis. And the acceleration is a centripetal acceleration, so it's going to be also downwards towards the center. So I got here MA. Now it's a centripetal acceleration, so I can replace the A by V squared now and get an expression for my tension. That's the solution at A. Now let's find it at B. Again, I will apply the second law of Newton. So T plus mg equals ma. I will choose an axis, so this time I will put it upwards, more convenient. I can now remove the arrows and put the signs. Tension is upwards, gravity downwards, so minus, and acceleration is upwards, so ma, which I can replace by mv squared now. I get, again, an expression of my tension. Now, notice the change of sign for mg. The tension is bigger here than there. It's pulled more. Here, the gravity participates into the centripetal acceleration. Here, it goes against. Therefore, the tension in the string is bigger. It's pulling more the string. If the string would break, it would more break here than there. 
It would break here instead of that, excuse me. For instance, there's exercises where you have to find the velocity, the linear velocity at which a string breaks. And they give you the maximum tension before the string breaks. Well, it would be this equation that you would need to use. Question C. Calculate the minimum speed so that the string always stays straight. Hmm. That's an interesting question. The string always stays straight. What does that mean? That means that in my motion, the distance between the object and the center of the circle must always be the same. Therefore, we can translate this question as calculate the minimum speed so that the object is in a circular motion or stays in a circular motion. Okay, so just imagine that I don't have a string, okay, and that the object is at A and I cut a string and it's going quite fast. Therefore, if it's going fast, it will just be under the influence of gravity and in free fall, like you've seen in kinematics. If I have a speed of slightly lower, well, it would be like this. So it's, it's like when throwing an object from a cliff. Now, there will be a speed where my trajectory will be exactly circular. And that corresponds, and even if there's a string, or there could be a string, but the tension would be zero. And that would be the minimum speed for the circular motion to be still circular. Imagine if I didn't have a string, or even if I have a string, but I don't throw it strong enough, the velocity is too small. Well, it will just go into free fall, and the string will be all wobbly, there will be no tension in the string. Or you could, by calculations, if you look at this equation, minus mg would have a bigger magnitude than mv squared on r, so the tension would be negative. So the limit point is to consider that you don't have a string, but that the gravity acts as uh, the vector for the motion, which would be circular. So that corresponds to this case, where tension equals zero, the sweet spot. Let's write it down. Let's go there. And I would have tension equals zero, therefore m v min square r equals mg, the condition to have circular motion. I can get rid of the m's and you see simply that I get v, v min, equals square root of gr. The minimum speed for the object to have a circular motion, i.e. for the string to stay straight. Let's go now to the next exercise. Let's work this one out together. A vinyl record is placed on a player and rotates with a period of one second. An object of mass 0.040 kilograms is placed at a distance of 10 centimeters, let's call it r, so 10 centimeters or 1.1 meter, from the center of the disc. The object does not move relatively to the disc. On the, on the diagram, draw the velocity and acceleration vector felt by the object. Well, the object is going in a circular motion, therefore its velocity will be tangent to, its to, to the circle it describes, and the acceleration will be towards the center. Determine the angular velocity and the linear speed of the object. So that's simple, it's just appl applying the uh, equations. Omega is 2 pi on t, so that's 2 pi divided by 1, so 2 pi radians per second 
So now you put it into me no into numbers six point three radians per second. And the linear velocity where it's V equals R omega, so point one by two pi, and V would be equal to 0 0.63 radians. Oh sorry, excuse me, meters per second. Well, this question was pretty easy. Usually you get two marks for that. Don't miss it as an exam. Question C. The coefficient of static friction between the object and the disk is 0 0.78. What is the largest distance from the center of the disk where the particle can be placed without being ejected? So the disk is turning. So you can, you can imagine it in your head. You turn the disk slowly, the object on the disk won't move. But if you start accelerating uh, and turning more and more quickly, well, you will see that uh, at the moment, uh, after a certain velocity, the object will be ejected from the disk. That's due to the friction between the object and the disk. So let me show you what is meant by friction here. So you see here I have a book. If I push on the book, well, the book is not moving, even if I push, I'm not pushing very really hard, but I'm still pushing on the book, and it's not moving. The fact that it's not moving is because of friction. The force I apply and the force of friction oppose each other and are equal in magnitude. That's why the sum of forces is zero, the book is not moving. Therefore, the force of friction is equal to the force applied. But if I apply a force which is bigger, you saw the book just started to move. I'm in this situation where I just apply the force needed to start the book moving. In that case, the force of friction is equal to the uh, coefficient of static friction, which is actually due to the roughness of the surfaces here, and the weight of the book, which is expressed here by the normal force. If I push on the book, where the normal force increases, therefore, I need to apply more force to move the book, because the friction is bigger. Then, once I move the book, oh, it's all easy. It's difficult at the beginning, I can feel the resistance and then whoop, it becomes easier. This is because it's changed regimes. Now we arrive at, into a kinetic region where I applied enough force to move the book. And the force of friction is also proportional to the weight of the book or the normal force that I'm applying. Okay, something on it. But the coefficient of friction has changed. Now it's a kinetic coefficient of friction, which is usually a little smaller. Now, let's go back to our problem. What we are looking for is the maximum radius for a given angular velocity for which the object would stay on the disk. You see that the object has got a velocity this way. Oh, I'll just write down velocity here. This way. So, if it was alone in space, it would just go straight. So there must be something holding it back so that it can stay on the disk. That thing is friction. So, I represented the disk seen from the side here. Let's look at the forces on the object. So this is the axis of the disk. Well, there will be weight, mg, there would be the normal force, and both magnitudes will, the magnitudes of both vectors would be the same, because the object is not going up or down, it's staying at the same height. And there will be the friction force, which holds the object on the disk, preventing it to go straight. This friction force well, we want to find the friction force for which we have the maximum radius, meaning that just the point before it stops moving. And we know that such friction force equals, so I call it F max, the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. That's what we saw in the video with the book. 
n equals mg because they have the same magnitude. And here we go. Now, this force of friction is also what's causing the object to remain in a circular motion, stuck on the disk. So it is also equal to mv square on r or m omega square r. And we're looking at f max, so the maximum force, friction force, before it moves, so that corresponds to a radius, which is the radius we're looking for. Now these two forces are the same force, so we can equate these two expressions. So coefficient of static friction, mass, gravitational field strength, mass, uh, omega square, and the maximum radius. We can get rid of the masses, and we express this expression to put R max as subject, that's what we're looking for. Here we go, and I can just plug in the numbers. That's eta, eh? 9.8 divided by 4 pi squared. Yes, omega is 2 pi radians per second, so squared is 4 pi squared. And the value I find is 0.194 meters. We are talking with two significant figures, so we get R max is about 19 centimeters. Now, let's look at the next question, which is question D. The object is left at 10 centimeters from the center of the disk. So this time, the radius is fixed at 10 centimeters. And we are playing on the angular speed. What is the maximum angular speed the disk can have without ejecting the object? So it's the same question, basically, but we are just looking this time at omega max, not R max. So we can start the same way, actually use this equation and reformulate it. So I'm going to do it, I don't think there's enough space here, so I'm going to have to erase this. And do another section here for question D. So we're going to start with the same thing, R equals mu s g on omega max squared. So we've got R fixed, now it's the angular velocity. If you place the object here and you start increasing the angular velocity, there'll be a moment where boom, it will be ejected. So we can just reformulate this to get omega max equals square root of mu s g on R. Plug in the numbers, 078 multiply by 9.8 divided by 0 0.1 and that will give us 8.75 radians per second. Did you find these uh, values? If not, I encourage you to check it out again. This is typical of the kind of exercise you find in exams. Actually, the three exercises we did during this uh, video. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed these exercises as well as the series on circular motion. This uh, video closes uh, the playlist on circular motion. So we will be talking about other topics uh, from now on. I wish you good luck, lots of courage for your studies, and I'll see you in a next edition of IB Physics Made Easy. Bye.